I don't know, Kieran Mufti, just three, huh? And Vanilla? Just three, huh? Tayyip? Sheikh? It's totally off the table. You see? Yeah, you are. Speak some of this coffee, yo. Are we? Ah, stream. Hmm? Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in, amma ba'd. First question says, Assalamu alaikum. Do the dhuhr and asr prayers have to be read silently when praying alone? I do not live near a masjid, so I pray most of my fard alone. For all salah, I read fairly loudly, a loud whisper, so that I can hear what I am reciting. Reciting aloud like this enables me to focus and pray with khushu because it allows me to focus on the words, think about them, and be affected by them. Is it okay for me to pray dhuhr and asr like this? If I pray silently, I cannot focus, pray with khushu because my mind wanders and becomes clouded with other things. I feel like my prayer becomes empty and just motions. Please help clarify. Jazakallahu khaira. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have a fine example. Allah tells us. In the Messenger of Allah, you have a fine example. In other words, the finest example. The best example. The Prophet والسلام, was the greatest musalli. He was the biggest, greatest person to make salah. Period. So how he made salah, what he did and what he didn't do, is more than enough for you. There wasn't a person who prayed to Allah Azza wa with greater khushu than him. So anything that he did, recited, silently, aloud, he raised his hand. So no one can say, you're raising your hands too much, you're about to fly in the prayer. As it's narrated that one of the imams said, لَقَدْ كِتَّ أَنْ تَطِيرُ You're about to fly away in the salah. Whatever the Prophet did, is the ultimate manifestation of khushu, period. So what did the Prophet said do in the silent prayers? And what did he do in the audible prayers? What did he tell us and what did he allow us? And I can't just do it. That is what you should do. So you have to fight yourself to be submissive to the sunnah. You have to fight yourself to be submissive to how Muhammad said did it. If it's difficult in the beginning, if it's problemsome, problem some, burdensome in the beginning, you have to fight yourself until Allah Azza wa gives you the coolness in your heart. So it's not an option, it's not a choice. The general rule of following Muhammad Sallallahu way. As far as the specific technical fiqh ruling of reciting Allah or silently, then the ulama of Islam say, reading Salat al-Maghrib, the first two raka aloud, reading Salat al-Dhuhr, all four raka silently, they said it's recommended. It's recommended. It's from the recommended acts of the prayer. It's not necessarily mandatory or haram to do the opposite. But it's against the sunnah to continue to do it and practice it like that. Salat after salat, every single day you recite dhuhr out loud. That's going to become problematic without a doubt. And it's going to lead to you scorning and disdaining the sunnah. There's no doubt about that. What leads to khushur? Try your best to do it in the way in which Prophet Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad did it. And that's the best khushur. 
as far as if you had to do it from time to time, what's one thing? That's one thing. What's unnecessary for you to intentionally go against the guidance of Muhammad with the claim, I feel better, I feel closer. Once you open up that door, there's a door open up to all havoc and chaos. I feel close to Allah when I do it like this. That's why Bid'ah was made. It's the intention of innovation. It's for a person to get to Allah closer, faster, and more powerfully. And that's incorrect. Everybody understand this? Allah Azza wa Jalla, He tells us in the Quran Kareem that Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam, He made dua to him. Allah says, Abraham said, Give me a, a truthful statement, a truthful tongue. Huh? And he made dua to Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive him of his sins, to forgive him of his father who was ignorant, who didn't know, who was astray. Don't disgrace me on the day in which your slaves are resurrected. Do not disgrace me on the day in which your slaves will be resurrected. A day in which wealth won't avail, children can't help out. Illa, except for one, atallaha biqalb salim, who comes to Allah Azza with a sound heart, a secure heart, a pure, wholesome heart. And some of the ulama of Islam they say al qalb salim qalb al mu'min, لِأَنَّ قَلْبَ الْكَافِرِ وَالْمُنَافِقِ مَرِيضٌ وَمِنْهُ مَنْ قَالَ هُوَ الْقَلْبُ الْمُطْمَئِنِ إِلَى السُنَّةِ الْخَالِ مِنَ الْبِدْعَةِ it's the heart that feels secure with Allah and feels safe and sound and is okay with the sunnah and not with bid'ah. So if you can't find comfort in how Muhammad did it, something's wrong with your iman. Period. Wallahu alam. Assalamu alaikum. SM from Toronto, Canada. Mufti, you did a Q&A recently in which you answered my question regarding the differences between a Nabi and a Rasul. However, I'm still confused. You mentioned that in your opinion, the difference is, and correct me if I misunderstand you or if I misunderstood you, a Nabi is one who comes to confirm or to establish the Sharia of the previous Rasul. And a Rasul comes with a new Sharia. Based on the little knowledge I have, I find this little problematic for one reason. I find this a little problematic for one reason. There's a hadith which mentions the day of judgment and how mankind will go from prophet to prophet asking them to intercede with Allah for us. When we go to Nuh, the hadith says that he will say, O oh Noah, you are the first from among the messengers of Allah to the people of the earth. Adam was the first of mankind, both created and sent to the earth. So the first ever sharia of mankind was the sharia of Adam. And if the hadith I mentioned is authentic, the definition you gave for prophets and messengers would be incorrect. Because Adam had his own sharia. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying if anything I previously said adds up properly, then your definition will be problematic. And since you know more than me, I need you to correct my understanding. May Allah bless you abundantly. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you abundantly as well. With regards to this issue... Uh, is a few misunderstandings and the first misunderstanding is we never ever said that the difference between the Nabi and the Rasul is that the Nabi comes to reestablish a previous legislature and the Rasul we said that's what some of the ulama say and we never quoted that as our opinion and our view our reservation our specific tarjih what we feel is most correct that's first and foremost secondly is Adam alayhi salatu salam According to the questioner, and alhamdulillah, we thank the questioner for seeking further detail. We thank the questioner for trying to, you know, benefit, trying to, alhamdulillah, that's a good thing, showing effort. Alhamd. However, if Adam a.s. was sent to earth with sharia, where is the proof for that? That he has a sharia, he was sent to earth with sharia. Him and his offspring, his children and his progeny, what were they upon? Was there any difference of opinion? Was there any shirk and kufr? By clear on this, what was the what, what is what for God said it's Nuh alayhi salam being the first Rasul. And what did the Ulama of Islam say about the children of Adam between Adam and Nuh alayhi salam? What were they upon? What were they doing? Was Adam a prophet? Was he a prophet? Did he receive a book? Did he receive a scripture? All of these things have to be established before we can even get to this introduction. It has to be proven in authentic narrations. And the Ulama of Islam is well known that they differ on whether Adam was a Nabi or not. They do not unanimously say that he was a Nabi. Everybody clear on this? So therefore, some of the ulama of Islam, they hold views with regards to 
the difference between a Nabi and a Rasul. The view that we feel is most correct is that a Nabi and a Rasul both get revelation from Allah. Is that a Nabi and a Rasul both are sent to their respective peoples. Both of them. Mm -hmm. But a Rasul is a ha notch above. With a bigger message, a more important message, a more independent message. Regardless whether the Nabi, someone came before him or not. Obviously the Anbiya afterwards that came after the Rusul. They, according to those ulama, reaffirmed the previous messages and legislatures. So the question is now, this is the last thing I'll mention here, is what is the first, a Rasul or Nabi? If Adam alayhi salam, if we said, if he was a Nabi, and then Nuh alayhi salam came as a Rasul, then obviously Adam is not confirming anyone's legislature when he was the first man created. But if he wasn't a Nabi, then we exclude that problem altogether. Or one may say is that the Rasul comes first, which was Nuh alayhi salatu salam. And the people who came after Nuh were either Rasul or Anbiya, messengers or prophets. And Adam alayhi salatu salam, based off of that, would not be a what? Nabi. So it's detail on the situation. There's a bit of misquoting here in the question. Hopefully it's clearer now. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahu alam. Assalamu alaikum. Is leasing a car in Canada US, or slash US halal? Jazakallah khairan. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah reward you well. It depends. We know most institutions, one way or another, deal with some type of haram uh, element. Whether it's selling that which they don't own, whether it's uh, giving you a loan based on interest, naam, and different things like this. Jihala, gharar, a contract. Being extremely risky, being unknown, and the list goes on. What's important is for someone to allow you to rent a thing, quote unquote, they lease you a thing, a car, and the price is at a higher rate because it comes in installments, deferred installments. There's nothing wrong with that. As we've explained before with the ulama, not all of them, but some of them say with regards to bay or taqsid, is that the product is normally $500 up front if you buy on the spot but if you buy the product within 12 months on credit the product is now seven hundred dollars and these all mass some of them they say that it's permissible with two conditions first condition is that the price must be known from the beginning and secondly is that the installments and the time of the installments must be known from the beginning khayr inshallah as far as a bank buying a car and then loaning you the car, leasing you the car at a higher rate and the bank is charging you interest for their own benefit and their own gain, then that's clearly problematic. And that's clearly riba. There's a difference here. Or the bank giving you or lending you, quote unquote, you're leasing the car as if they own the car. In actuality, they don't own the car, nor are they necessarily agents of the company, but it's a fusion of riba. A riba line between them and between you, then that's different, that's haram. So it depends on the specifics of the leasing. We know in general, most leases pertain to what? The first or the second scenario? The first or the second? Which of the two? The, some say first, some say second. So that's the ruling is, depending on what the scenario is. Wallahu alam, that's in brief. Any questions here, inshallah? If there are any questions here, obviously we have to share. We have to share the time. Okay, you have questions on the brothers and sisters in Masjid Taqwa. Perhaps maybe the sisters, not necessarily the brothers, so ask them any questions. Alhamdulillah. People online, people from Mufti Qunay, people from Hadith Disciple, from all over the world. So we try to huh, split up, inshallah, on Tala. So we're done with that, with Mufti Q&A for tonight, inshallah. Are there any questions from the brothers and sisters here in the physical essence? Father John. Question says, can you mention some of the benefits of dates? We say, first and foremost, 
just using your mind just a bit for Allah to choose his last prophet and his last messenger and to make the staple thing that they eat one of their main foods the bread and butter of the Arabs just a means of crude substance a piece of fruit that you eat that's it it's sweet sugary it's brown and that's it nothing more that really doesn't make too much sense the main means of nutrition of his last prophet and messenger not to have some type of special some type of strong significance just doesn't make too much sense and that's unbefitting of Allah's infinite wisdom subhanahu wa ta'ala not something that they ate something that they did something that they liked something that they enjoyed but their main what staple food and it has of no significance or no value just beyond putting something in your mouth and that obviously what that's not befitting of Allah Azza wa Jalla's huh? limitless wisdom. It's a mention of Ibn Qayyim Rahim Allah Ta'ala and Al Hadi. So he says there are many benefits of the date, whether it's spiritual benefits or whether it's nutritional benefits. As far as the nutritional benefits, then it's well known. The energy, the natural sweetness, and the sugar of the date, how it replenishes the body, how it can suffice you from eating other things and other foods, as it's well known. And as far as the spiritual benefit of the date, then we know the different narrations. Some of those narrations talk about sihr, sorcery. Some of those narrations with regards to the concept of barakah, hmm? or protection against illness and sickness. Huh? And the concept of wholesomeness, physically and spiritually. The barakah of the date. This is well known. So these are some of the wisdoms that we know about with regards to the virtues of dates. Whether it is a mixture of spiritual and actual tangible benefits, health and iman, just pertaining to iman, or just pertaining to what? One's health. In actuality, there's no contradiction between the two. If the Prophet ﷺ says that there's something special about black seed, if it's something special about dates, if it's something special about zamzam, it doesn't mean that there isn't a tangible scientific explanation. It doesn't mean that it isn't something which is what? Proven an ingredient and an agent in that food and that drink which causes those supernatural benefits to descend that's in brief wallahu alam it's in brief shake we'll come back inshallah fadal initials mh from london uk Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Beloved Sheikh, may Allah bless you and increase you in goodness. I mean, what advice do you have for those who lose motivation in seeking knowledge? What advice do you have for those who lose motivation in seeking knowledge? The general advice that we give, whether you lose motivation or not, is to keep your nose in the books. Keep continuing to read the stories and the biographies of Al Hadith all of the time. When you feel inspired, you feel motivated, when you're not so inspired, you're not so motivated, when you're in the middle, when you're a beginner, when you're advanced, when you're a master, is to continue to reflect and continue to compare yourself, continue to place yourself in that large, huge, gigantic shade of those ulama of hadith. What they did, what they went through, what they sacrificed, what they benefited, how they benefited, and the list goes on. Bidinahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is my advice. Inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet والسلام, he tells us. إِنَّ لِكُلِّ عَمَلٍ شِرَّةٍ وَإِنَّ لِكُلِّ شِرَّةٍ فَتْرَةٍ فَمَنْ كَانَتْ فَتْرَةٌ إِلَى سُنَّتِي فَقَدْ اِهْتَدَى وَمَنْ كَانَتْ فَتْرَةٌ إِلَى غَيْرِ ذَلِكَ فَقَدْ هَلَكَ على حديث أخرج الإمام أحمد عن عبد الله بن عمر بن العاص The Prophet says, he says, إِنَّ لِكُلِّ عَمَلٍ شِرَّةٍ He says, every deed, every act that you perform, which includes seeking knowledge, which includes seeking in, that's a deed, that's an amal, has a shirra, has a flare, a time of spark. Everybody understand this? Has a time of vigor, a high point, a high. He says, well, in every shirra, every flare of point of spark has a fetra in which it wanes. In which it wanes, it goes down. It's, huh? The energy isn't there. Hmm? You're not as motivated. He says, so therefore, anyone whose fetra, whose time of waning is towards my sunnah, then he will be guided. And anyone, when they slacken, or when they lose steam, quote-unquote, 
it's the other in my sunnah, then they will be destroyed. So this hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As clearly shows us is that you need to have a basic standard for when you fall low. A basic standard when you lose motivation. When you lose motivation. In other words, I always read something, no matter how I'm feeling. Whether well, it's one page, two pages, every day. When I'm down, I'm out, I'm blue, I'm stressed, I'm tired. I make sure that I have something, some type of minimum standard. But when I'm motivated, when I'm feeling good, I read 100 pages. For example, hypothetically speaking. Mm -hmm. The problem is not allowing yourself to fall beneath the standard of what? One page. Let that be a balance that you cannot fall beneath. And you have to make that, obviously. You have to establish that. You have to earn that. Everybody understand this? And from the ways of establishing that, one page or 100 pages, is to read about Imam Bukhari. It's to read about this alim, Fulan, Imam Ahmed, Sufyan Authority, and what they did and how they traveled. And just to be sheerly, utterly amazed at what they did. Be the nice panel with Tyler. And you look at the technology that you have, the simplicity that you have, the modern means of travel that you have. Everybody understand this? That's my advice. Be the nice panel with Tyler. And there are many other pieces of advice that we've given abundantly with regards to this issue. But that's the advice that I would give right now is to read the Tarajim of Ahl Hadith. Read the seer, read the stories of a hadith. And alhamdulillah, there are many books in English that deal with it, let alone in Arabic. As far as in Arabic, you get lost, literally. You become lost when you go on a journey hmm, of Imam Bukhari hmm, and others. Wallahu a'lam. Abdul Wadud. What is right hand possession? Question says, What is a right hand possession? There's two meanings one is linguistic, and one is. Legislative. As far as linguistic, that which I possess in my right hand. I own it. It's mine. Whether it's my right hand or my left hand. As far as in the deen, the one meant by a right hand possession is a concubine. A woman that you are legislatively allowed to have intimate relations with. She is not your wife. She was uh, one way or another uh, handed to you through legal, legitimate means. Not a girlfriend, not a lover, not a, a, a whatever word or term you want to use, but we're talking about an actual system of jihad, fi sabilillah. Hmm? Wallahu alam. Faldo. Wa alaykum as salam Question says, we heard you mention in class that it's not obligatory for a man to take his wife on Hajj. So how does she make Hajj if that's the case? The first initial concept of Abu Sayyid of this is financially. That's not the only, but that's the initial meaning of not obligatory. And not necessarily meaning initially, it isn't obligatory for him to physically go, but financially. In other words, I do not have to pay for your Hajj. You clear on this? This is very important for us to have a proper understanding. I am not obliged to spend the money on your Hajj. It's a good deed. It's a virtuous deed. Helping your wife upon bir and taqwa, completing her deen, but it is not what? Fard. It's only fard upon me. Everybody understand this. Feeding you, clothing you, give you a comfortable, nice place to live, car, shoes, all of that is what? Clear fard. Must. Hajj is outside of that fard. And if I do it, and it's a virtue. So that's first and foremost. As far as if the woman has the money, and she has the ability, the physical ability to go, and she has no other mahram, then qad alik. Perhaps it becomes obligatory for you to accompany her. But obviously a woman is not a must that you're the only mahram. It's not a must. Whether it's her father, her brother, her son, what happened that? Everybody clear on this? Let alone the fact if a woman chooses to go make hajj without a mahram, like many women do, for one reason or another. Whether they're ignorant of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, or whether they say, the group of hajj, that's my mahram, the hajj group, the hajj leader, ha, huh? I'm with a bunch of sisters, whatever the case may be. Everybody clear on this? But the initial maqsood, the meaning, fil is finances. 
after that, once she has the necessary finances, or you give her the money. Let's say she makes hajj off of what you give her. You give her some money. She saved it up. What heck that? Everybody understand that? But once the money leaves your hands into her hands, it's no longer yours. It's now hers. And she can do whatever she wants to do with it. Everybody clear on this? That's what's meant. Allah Alam. Hopefully that's clear. Fadl. Bismillah. You gotta ask. Are there any other questions from the brothers and sisters here? Type. Fadl. Nice. And this was JW from Washington, D.C. If a masjid offers two Juma service and I am uh, able to, I am able without restriction to attend either, is it best to attend one over the other? Continue. The Zuhur time is approximately 1.15. The two services are 12 p.m. and 1.15. Barakallah. Question in regards to Juma prayers, making more than one Juma in one masjid from Washington, D.C. There are many different issues in this question. The first issue is, is it permissible to do this? The general brief answer, it's not a detailed answer right now, is that if there's a need and if there's a necessity, then it's permissible to hold more than one Jum'ah and one Masjid. If there is a need or a necessity. It's not enough space. Okay, it says maximum. What's that? 200 and what? How many people? 232. Yeah. It's too many brothers. It's 500 people come to Jum'ah. And that's going against the rules of the city. It's a fire hazard and this goes on. So we are forced to split the congregation in two. 232 brothers come and then another 223 brothers or however brothers come later on. A need or a necessity. Time, location, schedule, we'll have to get that. That's the first part of the question. Hopefully that's clear. As far as which service has precedence, then I would say, Bidinai Ta'ala, go with the main Jumu'ah. And most masjids, well, I can't say most, but the ones that I've been to, most of them, times which I've done more than one khutbah, is clearly known, it's a clear definition of the main service. The first one is the main Jumu'ah. Then the second one is the footnote, the sidearm. Huh? The, uh, that's the baby Jumu'ah, which the crowd isn't as big, as which the attendance isn't the same. The khatib doesn't give him, huh? everybody clear on this? So I will go to the Jumu'ah, that's the Asr, the Mother Jumu'ah. The Mother Jumu'ah, everyone understand this? The Mother Jumu'ah. However, it doesn't mean that the baby Jumu'ah is insignificant or of no virtue or you can't benefit from that khutbah as well. does not mean that. As far as what's mentioned, there's a bit of confusion here with regards to the time. Salat al-Dhuhr is 1.15 and they pray Jumu'ah at 12 o'clock. What do you mean Salat al-Dhuhr is 1.15? Do you mean that Salat comes in at 1.15? Or it comes in at 1 p.m. and the Iqam is 1.15? I.e. 12 o'clock, hypothetically speaking, will be before the time of Salat al-Dhuhr. Will be before the time of Salat al-Dhuhr. I.e. be before the Zawal. Qabul al-Zawal. If it's before the time of Salat al-Dhuhr, then it's problematic and sticky now. Because those ulama who say that you cannot make Salat al-Jumu'ah, until it's time for Salat al-Dhuhr. And Jumu'ah is a substitution and a replacement for Salat al-Dhuhr. So obviously you'll be praying before the proper time. As far as you take the view of Imam Ahmed, Allah, a Shokani and others, who said that you can make Jumu'ah early in the morning, like the Eid, then that's a different story. But I don't think that's what they meant here. Wallahu alam. What's important is, is that the Imam, the administration, the board, the board, the Imam, they all should have some basic fiqh. And they should all work together, cooperate with each other. And the people who are specialists in finance and money management and politics, the people who have the charisma, the skills to run a center, huh? they must know their limit. And they must humble themselves to the imam, assistant imam, or resident scholar. If you don't know, do not speak. Do not give fatwa. And you must depend upon the learned people. Just as you don't allow the imam to interfere in the finances of the masjid, you should not interfere with the fiqh of the masjid. And I don't, I'm not sure if that's the case here, but this is a very, 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 very common problem in most masjids around America, UK, especially in America. The administrators are the fuqaha of the masjid. They say what and what is halal and haram, what should and shouldn't be done. And obviously that's going to be what? Ruinous. It's going to be ruinous. And the opposite as well. 
The imam is not a finance man. He's not a person who, unless he does know, but he, is, he shouldn't be someone that's having, wearing so many hats. He can't focus on one thing. And interfering with finances, you study Sharia, alhamdulillah, Hanafi madhab. Not finances and money. This is a different story now. You have your expertise, we have ours, and we both respect each other, and most importantly, what? Work together. Hmm? Wallahu alam. Sheikh from London, uh, Sheikh uh, Shakib uh, from London. Assalamu alaikum. Haik Allah wa stay. What is the shahr of this hadith? Yadukhul al ahl al jannati al jannat Jordan Murdan. Mukhalina Abana Salasa Salasina Aw Salah Aw Salasin. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh First and foremost, if you can please email us the hadith The way it can be clear and I can clearly read it myself And we can know exactly what narration you're talking about If you can please email us the hadith As far as the general meaning right now, right here From what uh, Nafis read Is that the people of Jannah will enter paradise In a specific way Specific outward appearance And inward appearance as well their physical appearances, their hearts as well, their age, as is mentioned here, 33 years old, so on and so forth. So the different narrations that talk about how the people of Jannah will be, whether it's their size or what they will enjoy, what they will wear, how, what their faces will look like, what their hearts will be like. Everybody clear on this? What's important is that the night Ta'ala, they will be in a perfect form. And to maximize the benefit of Jannah, they're going to be Bidin night Ta'ala, and the optimum or what the maximum amount of physical mental and spiritual what perfection and strength with regards to the foods that we eat in Jannah, the drinks that they will have the women that will be there the men and the list goes on everybody understand this they will be have a, a perfect what perfection a Jannah is not just you going to a place that's really nice in this life you may go to a big party a banquet but you're still insecure about your appearance. How do I look? Do I look fat in this? Is this too tight? Fulan is going to be there. He looks better than me. Fulan is going to be there. Her style is, is sharper than my style. But the place that you're going to is first class. First class ballroom. Everybody understand this? Everything is going to be here in this party. But me, myself, I'm still what? An imperfect how I look. Everybody understand this? So the Jinnah here, metaphorically speaking, is the banquet hall. Or the rich man, the, the, the wealthy man's or wealthy woman's mansion, the palace. That's the Jannah. Perfect. But me, I'm still what? Imperfect. Physically imperfect. And also what? Mentally imperfect because I'm insecure. I think I look to this, I look to that. I don't look well in heels. I don't look... Uh, this. Everybody understand this? No matter how much wealth you have. Everybody clear on this? Everybody understand this or not? Everybody understand this? Last but not least is that you're also spiritually imperfect. Because you may go to the party and you may think of immoral things. Flirting, this and that. It's well known. People that go to parties, they cheat. Uh, people go to parties, they, they scam people. They make business deals when someone's half drunk. A lawyer gets the celebrity in a room by himself. Uh, and he gives them an offer. And he gets them to sign a contract which he's basically ripping them off. Everybody understand this is a reality. But the banquet hall, the palace is still what? Totally perfect. But you yourself are what? Imperfect. So Jannah is all four elements. The place is what? Beyond description. The slave that's entering Jannah is going to be physically perfect. Mentally pure and clean. Everybody understand this? No jealousy, no malice, no rancor. That time you did something to me. That time you invited me to dinner and I said no. You felt some type of way about it. It came out as a joke later on, but you really were offended. That time in which you backbit me or you made a joke, you called me a, a name. I was delinquent. I laughed about it, but deep down inside, it may have been what? It's a truth in every joke. Well, how can that? There's none of that in paradise whatsoever. None of that in paradise. 
except for absolute purity. So the person that's going to Jannah is what? Pure. Physically, mentally, spiritually what? Pure. And the place is already what? That's not the same as what? This dunya. Mm -hmm. So the different narrations that talk about what they will look like, what their hearts will be like, what their face will be like. Hopefully that's clear. Allahu Akbar. says where the men not have beards well, if the Prophet Sallallahu hadith tells us something then that's what we go with it's just that simple with the condition that it's authentic so if it's authentic that's what it is initials HA from Toronto Canada this live stream FaceTime live YouTube take the same ruling as taking photography Question says, does live stream, Facebook, FaceTime, etc. take the same ruling as photography? Yes and no. According to some ulama, it does. And they say any type of imagery, any type of camera or video or illustration, anything, takes the ruling of taswir. Are you about clear on this? Mm -hmm. Regardless whether taswir, taswir is halal or haram, but it takes its ruling. Are you about clear on this? Khairin, inshallah ta'ala. And no... With regards to those ulama who may say that taswir is muharram, which is the consensus of all of the ulama, that the Prophet ﷺ cursed the musawwireen. And he informed us they will have the worst punishment on the Day of Judgment. And they'll be humiliated, and they'll be asked questions which they cannot answer on the Day of Judgment. There's no difference of opinion about that. But what and how does that taswir apply? The Prophet ﷺ clearly said that Allah cursed the musawwireen. There's no difference about that being haram. You can't say it's khilaf, it's makru, no. But a video camera does not necessarily have to be the same thing as is mentioned in that hadith. Alright, by clearness, that's a different story, which we have explained in detail on our channel in several videos. Alright, so what's important is those ulama who say that it is included in that taswir, some of them may make an exception to the rule when it comes to da'wah. When it comes to da'wah. They may say you cannot take pictures, you cannot make videos, you cannot uh, do a uh, Facebook video, whatever it can be, unless it's pertaining to da'wah and that which is a major benefit for the Muslims. Right, those are those ulama who say that taking a video is haram. As far as those ulama who say that it is not haram, then obviously whether it is or whether it isn't, it's permissible. Right, clearness, we've explained this detail and some we've explained this issue with some type of detail, even though we're still brief, but it's some type of detail. In our video, inshallah ta'ala, a brief discussion of a taswir on Hadith Disciple channel. Please go back to that lecture. There are many details therein that you will not find in one source, in English or in Arabic. Wallahu alam. Abu Dris. Is there a difference between a place which is bought and owned? Between the place which is rented with regards to a masjid. Some of the ulama of Islam, they say that a musalla is a temporary place. A small place or relatively large, but a place that's relatively temporary. It, one day it's a musalla, the next day it may not be a musalla. And what you pray in, person sits in, learns and studies, person may even pray Jum'ah they're in. But they say as, an actual, as, for, as for an actual jamia. An actual quote-unquote mosque. Hmm? Something that is not possessed or owned by this one and that one. But it's for Allah. Waqf. It's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It isn't something that's rented out. It isn't something that can be traded and passed on. Right, by clearing this from this person to the next, shut down and closed. So therefore, many of the ulama, they say that if there is a revamped house, uh, 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 yeah, I need the people, they... Renew a house or a storefront or a basement or an attic or in the projects, whatever the case may be, whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. huh? They say that it's a musalla. But if the prayers are made therein, if the Jumu'ah is delivered on a consistent basis, then it takes most of the rulings of the masjid, the jamia. Wallahu alam. Fadl. question is concerning Jumu'ah. I'm to have uh, more than one question. First question is, you had mentioned earlier that some scholars uh, take Juma as a substitute for uh, Dhuhr, and others say that it's, it's not. Juma and Dhuhr, is, uh, one is not a substitute for the other, so it can be prayed at a time outside of the 
No more time. So is there, there's the rule for um, the sunnah before and after dhur apply in Juma. And would that depend on which position you take? Clear. Next question. Next question was uh, for Juma, can you combine Juma with Asma? Taib. In case of rain or travel or whatever. Taib. Khair, inshallah. <coughs> First question with regards to uh, the different views on Salat al Dhuhr and Salat al Juma'ah. Is Juma'ah a replacement and a substitution for Dhuhr, or is it its own separate prayer by itself? Very important question, very critical question. Whereas there are rulings that spring forth from both views, do's and don'ts. Everybody understand this? Secondly, is with regards to the Sunnah, the prayers that are voluntarily offered before Dhuhr and after Dhuhr. Does it also branch off of the previous issue? Is that if Juma'ah is a replacement for Dhuhr, then it will be before and after for Juma'ah. Well, how can that? As far as the first question, be the next panel with Ta'ala. Repeat the question again, Sheikh, please. Uh, the, the first question was with respect to um, Juma'ah, whether or not it's a substitute. Or, uh, Clear. Sorry. And the second part of the question, excuse me, was with regards to combining Juma'ah and Asr because of inclement weather or anything like this. As far as is it a substitution or not, then from one aspect it is. And from another aspect it isn't. Clearly. From the is part of the answer is that if you make Salatul Juma'ah, you don't have to make Salatul Dhuhr. And if you miss Salatul Juma'ah, then you obviously have to make Salat al -Dhuhr. So that clearly establishes and proves that Juma'ah took the place of Dhuhr on Friday. That Juma'ah was the substitute and the replacement. Five prayers the Prophet told us that Allah has ordained and legislated. I made Salat al Fajr. I made Salat al Asr. I made Salat al Maghrib. I made Salat al Isha. That's four. The fifth prayer, obviously, on Friday is Juma'ah. So from one aspect, that clearly establishes that it is a replacement and a substitution. But from another aspect, it's totally different. Whereas there's a list of conditions, of prerequisites for Juma'ah that do not apply to Salat al mm -hmm. Such as how many people have to be there for Juma'ah. Such as traveling and making Juma'ah. Such as a woman coming to Juma'ah. Such as a sick person, and the list goes on, making a ghusl for Juma'ah. There's several different akam that clearly show that there are lack of consistencies between the two and Juma'ah in itself is his own separate what? prayer everybody clear on this? Yeah. so it's like in the middle right now mm -hmm. so with that being said if we have specific legislation of what to make before and after the Lord or before and after Juma'ah then that's clear and if we have no specific legislation then one perhaps could say the same before and after prayers apply to Juma'ah but that's not necessarily the case do we have an authentic hadith, authentic hadith, that shows that the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to make an amount of prayers before Jumu'ah? A sunnah for Jumu'ah before. As far as afterwards, then it's clearly established. As Abdullah ibn Umar narrated, the Prophet ﷺ made rak'atain in his home after Jumu'ah. And Sahih Muslim and others. And some narration says four rak'at. And that's similar to Dhuhr as well, but a bit different. So therefore, in the beginning, before Jumu'ah, if we don't have a specific hadith, Stating what and what not to do, then it's general, it's left open. Afterwards, it's clearly restricted. Everybody clear on this? As far as combining Jumu'ah and Asr, and some of the other mass say that it's permissible to do so. And the reason why it's permissible is, as you said, based off of the fact that Jumu'ah is a replacement for Dhuhr. And if you can combine between Asr and Dhuhr for obvious reasons, then those reasons also apply to Jumu'ah and Asr. Such as traveling, such as rain, such as snow, such as sickness, and the list goes on. And this what? And the list goes on. One may say, due to the fact that Jumu'ah is prayed in two rak'ah, okay, it's recited aloud, it's made in a bigger congregation. One may say that clearly proves that it's different. And that's some, the view of many of those ulama say that you can't combine the two. And some say no. The meaning is clear. The need for making dhuhr and asr together can also be applicable to the need of making Juma'ah and Asr together. I mean, perhaps that's the closest view. Wallahu alam.
This was AA from Montreal, Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa Sheikh. Does exposing aura during salah invalidate it? If somebody, if someone, a brother, have the upper part of the butt exposed during salah, need to remake the salah. Question from Montreal says, does exposing the aura or the aura being exposed for a period of time um, render the prayer to be false or null and void? Such as one's backside, and the list goes on. Khairan, inshallah. I just want to give a brief benefit before we answer this question. And it was a comment on a video with regards to what is Islamic clothing? What is Sunnah clothing? Sunnah clothes, Islamic clothes. As we said before, this is a controversial issue in 2017. And there are some people who say that there's no such thing as Muslim clothes. There's no such thing as Islamic clothes. There's no such thing as Sunnah clothes. And all things that Muslim wears of Tawpi or Kufi or Taqiyya or Qulunsawa or Imama or Ghutra, Shimag, Kamis, Sharwa Kamis, Izzad, it says all of it is cultural. There is no Sunnah clothing. And the Prophet ﷺ, one person, he said, he was just like the Mushrikeen. That's what he said. He didn't wear clothes different than Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab. That's what he said. So you can't say that. The thobe came 200 years after the Prophet's death. It was from the Persians. It wasn't even an Arabic piece of clothing. And this goes on. Fight. And some of them, they say that you should wear pants and a shirt as it's your custom in America. People don't wear what? Dresses. Gowns. You go to the cleaners for it to be uh, dry cleaned or pressed or fixed. It's written down as a what? A gown or a dress. And they charge you more money. It's not slacks. It's not a shirt. So some people, they say that not only is incorrect to say that it's the sunnah to wear this or something similar to this, but they say you should wear pants and a shirt. Tell you. And then there are others who say the exact opposite, that it is the sunnah to wear the traditional pieces and garments of clothing that are known to the Muslims. Whether it's a golf type thobe, whether it is the dress of the brothers who come from West Africa or East Africa, whether it's the Muslims in Malaysia and Indonesia, whatever is well known from the clothing of the Muslims, the Muslims who come from Bangladesh, and the list goes on. And they say that that is the Sunnah. And some of them may even say it's mandatory to dress like this to be different from the people of Kufr and Shirk. And to be distinguished as a Muslim physically, spiritually, and mentally. And then there are those who are in the middle and they strike a balance. What's important is not to discuss this issue because we've answered this question before. But what I want to share with you is a comment that somebody made. And he said that there aren't too many things that you can wear in the salah that cover you as thoroughly, as easily, as loosely, and are that as comfortable as a thobe. When you make ruku, your behind is covered. You come out of ruku, it's covered. Sujood, jilsa, you stand, you move, it's covered. And it's loose and flowing. Pants, got to pull up the pants, put on your shirt. You got to make sure you roll up your pants and the list goes on. So the point is, this is a common, layman person making this comment. But the person, he used what? I would say, common sense. Just stop and think about it. What's the most thorough way of covering yourself in a prayer? Is it mandatory or not? That's not a discussion at hand. But the concept of going to the Salah in the best manner possible, in the easiest manner possible. Everybody understand this? Time for the event, inshallah. We, that, that's just the beginning, Shake. Yeah, that's, yeah. We're just warming up, Shake.
So therefore, the general concept of the most thorough way of covering yourself in a prayer, firstly. Secondly is the easiest way and the simplest way of covering yourself in the prayer. Based off of what the ulama of Islam mentioned, that the more humble you are, the more modest you are, the more covered you are in the salah, standing in front of Allah, is always best. As Allah commanded, he says, Ya Bani Adam, khudu zinatakum and the kulli masjid. Every time you intend to pray, O children of Adam, Allah says, cover your zina. Cover yourself. Be more bashful, more shameful, more modest in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is it mandatory? Is it fault? But it's best. You're going to a formal occasion, a business meeting. I can get the job with my qualifications, but let me look presentable. And the top of me looking presentable, let me look even better. Let me make sure I look smooth and sharp and smell good. I'm groomed because it's a serious affair that I'm going to. And I, it's nothing like the first impression. Everybody understand this? The sharper I look physically will also add to my what? Well, heck of that. That's just common sense that can't be denied. So the ulama of Islam, they say that Allah says, Khudu zinatukum and the masjid. Each and every time you wish to pray, cover your adornment, cover yourself. Everybody clear on this? Mm -hmm. That's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So therefore, this is the general concept of the clothing that's known to the Muslims <coughs> and its benefit in the prayer. We're not getting to the other issues, imitating the kuffar, pants. That's, that's outside of what we're discussing right now. We're talking about the ease, the simplicity, and the thoroughness of it in the what? In the salah. Khayran, inshallah. With that being said, if a man has on pants or... Any other you know, shorts or whatever the case may be, and his behind is exposed, his thigh becomes exposed when he makes the sujood, or whatever the case may be, then if he covers it, when he realizes it, he knows that it's uncovered and he, he covers it back, then inshallah ta'ala, hopefully there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe then his prayer is valid. As far as if he made the takbir and his altar was exposed, the entire prayer, and he finished and his altar continued to be exposed, then most of the ulama of Islam, jumhur al fuqaha, they hold the view that from the conditions and prerequisites of the salah is satr al awra. It's to cover the awra. Not all of the ulama, but most of them hold the view from the conditions of a valid prayer is that one's awra must be covered. And then we have the details on what is and what isn't a man's awra. Is it the shoulders? Is that from the awra? Or is it just from between the navel and the knee? Not above, but between. What is that? Everybody understand this? So let's hypothetically say that the aura is from that which, or that which is between the navel and the knee. My buttocks is, between, is beneath my what? I would say my navel. And if it becomes exposed, then my aura is what? Exposed. Everybody clear on this? So therefore, if it's exposed in a salah, then a prayer will be what? Null and void. Especially if it huh, continued in the entire duration of the prayer. As far as if it was exposed at a point by accident unintentionally and I fixed it immediately then perhaps the prayer is still valid even that is a, that's an argument in itself as a shokan and all the others have explained in detail with regards to uh, the concept of satr al or with regards to uh, the al and the najasa is that if the prophet prayed in the sandals that became defiled in the prayer he continued the prayer after he took off the sandals if it was a condition a shalt then the salah would have been null and void. And there would have been no istitnaf. There would have been no continue to doing it. It would have been you had to start over. Are you clear this? Mm -hmm. What's important is if you wear pants, that's fine. It's not mandatory to wear thobe. It is not mandatory to wear nizar. 
If you wear pants, that's fine. As long as the pants are above your ankles. As long as the pants are not tight. As long as the pants are not copycatting and mimicking a specific style of the kuffar. And as long as when you make the salah, your aura is not going to become exposed. But despite that, it's best to have an izar. To put on a fold. Whether you bring it out of your trunk in your car, you carry it in your book bag. Or whether it's a rack in the masjid in which there are thobes and izars for the brothers to put on. And the ulama of Islam, some of them, they say that if a person prays with sarawil, not trousers, but the pants that were known to the Muslims, you may see some brothers from that are Kurdish, or maybe Albanian, or maybe Turkish. You see certain type of pants that they wear. That's what's meant by sirwal. <coughs> trousers, bantalon is different. It's sirwal. It's nothing about sirwal. It's tight to the ulama and to the Muslims of the past. Some of them, they say that even if they're loose, a person should put on another piece of clothing. Whether it be an izar, a waist sheet, a kameez, something that covers his zina even what? Even more. This is a very important concept of the salat. It's to enter the salat with the most modesty and shyness that you possibly can. Wallahu alam. We're going to stop here, bin the ta'ala. Whereas we don't want to get cut off in the middle of a question. Or middle of an answer as we normally do. We get cut off. We don't want to get cut off. We don't want to get cut off. Inshallah. Zakum al khairan. Thank you, man. Fadl. Fadl. No. No, what should come between you and your sutra, even in Juma, unless it's extremely crowded and there's no other way in which they can get past. But the general rule is the Prophet says, La tu salli illa illa sutra. Don't pray unless towards the sutra. He doesn't allow anyone to come between you and your sutra.